1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Always can get the word. It's an awesome thing to know that I'm going to get the word every time I go to church. Amen. There's nothing like it. First Corinthians chapter two. I'm going to be doing the first five verses in First Corinthians chapter number two. When you get there, say amen. amen. Verse number one says, "And I, brothers, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech." of wisdom declared unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, say Jesus Christ and him crucified. And my speech, I'm sorry, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So we're going to pray. We're going to get right into God's word. Father, we thank you now for your word. Thank you for your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your truth. Now we ask you to speak to our hearts. Stay focused. We ask you to speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. Now we thank you now for your faith. Thank you for your grace. And thank you for all your goodness. Thank you for your precious son. Thank you for his death, his burial, his resurrection. Thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Lord, speak to our hearts now in Jesus' name. And the church says amen. amen. All right, you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. What I want to do is uh, minister his word, of course. But as I, I, as I minister God's word, there are some things... Uh, that God has showed me in his word. There's some things, so many things, if I can say it that way, that God has showed me in his word. Amen. So many things. But today, I'm following up. There's some things I've been teaching on the word faith, on the word grace. Uh, this ministry ministered to you the grace of God. Now, last week, uh, we talked to you about uh, eight reasons why God raised Jesus from the dead. And one of the things we showed you, he put an end to all feast days, celebration of the festivals. And if you don't understand that, that's Old Testament. And if you get caught up in that kind of stuff, you're not going to get ministered to you Christ. My job is to preach Christ. That's why this series here is called Paul Preach Christ. If you don't preach Christ, you can't receive the Holy Spirit. If you can't preach Christ, you cannot be, receive forgiveness. Why? You, because Christ is God's grace. Christ is God's wisdom. Christ is God's power. So what I want to do today is I want to add to the message. Now, remember, I'm on part six. I'm sorry. I'm on part five, volume six. Every series have six teachings. Every series have six teachings. So if I'm on part six, part five of volume six, five volumes, 30 tapes. I'm ministering you, the minister of the Apostle Paul, and I'm showing you he preached Christ. Now, my, my responsibility is to follow Paul. See, when you go into a church, uh, you right there in 1 Corinthians, let's look at uh, chapter 4. What happens is we go to a church and we don't know what to expect, so we just go to that church. We don't know why we go. We just the closest church down the road. And then when we go, we don't know why we're going. And so you have to understand that the Bible has already told you why you should go. The, the people who you trusted with your life is standing in the pulpit. He's called the preacher, the pastor of that church. And if that pastor of that church do not have the vision of God, does not have God's vision for your life, he can lead you to hell because you don't know he don't know. Let me say it again. You don't know that he don't know. 
That's why as a pastor, I've been ministering 40 years in the ministry and I've been 36 years pastoring. One of the greatest things I've learned is deception. It is something to be deceived and don't know you are deceived. So that's why Paul says not to put your faith in man's wisdom, but in the power of God. All right, so I want to talk about the day, which I got, I was talking about making this a series, but I'm not. I'm just going to leave it in what I'm doing right now because Paul preached also the kingdom. And so I want to, show, I want to teach you today, and, and I'm really back, at, back, 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 and back kind of thing because there's so much ahead of me that God has given me concern this, but he brought me back to this point to show me uh, the kingdom of God comes with power. That's what we're going to talk about today. If it's, if it's the kingdom, the kingdom of God come with power. So as a pastor, I have to know what God gave me to pastor this church. And if God did not give me the kingdom, I could not pastor this church. Said so the kingdom of God, kingdom God comes, with comes with power. Now, this is, this is what God gave the apostle Paul. He gave him the kingdom. This is what God gave Peter. But he gave him power. And we have to understand, if he gave you the kingdom, he had to give you the power. So that's why I'm speaking as a ministry gift now, as the pastor of this church. So, so let's get into this. Let's get into this because this is dear to my heart, and uh, uh, it's been on my heart all morning. As a matter of fact, you know I'm here all three hours before you come to church, so you understand that. So, so let's go. Let's get to work. So, in First Corinthians chapter four. Let's go and look at this. Paul says in verse number 10. Let's just read some of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 10. Paul said, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Even at this present time, we both hunger and we thirst and we are naked. Now, I'm using, I'm using 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5 as my uh, scripture to go with my message part 5 under volume 6 uh, Paul preached Christ the kingdom of God come with power I'm going to give you that scripture just a moment okay I'm going to show you that scripture just a moment uh, in this teaching I'm, I'm, in this reading I'm doing right now I'm going to give you the scripture when I get down to verse 19 and 20 so if you're making your tapes and your uh, DVDs and your podcasts and all this other stuff you can use 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 19 and 20 if you want to use those two scriptures. All right? Also, you can use 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Any of that's good. But I'm reading now down to my message. And verse number uh, 11. Even as unto this present, Paul says, we both hunger, we thirst, we're naked, we're buffet, and have no certain dwelling place. We labor, working with our hands, being reviled, we're blessed. Being persecuted, we suffer. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world. We are the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write none of these things, Paul said, to shame you, but as my beloved sons, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus, he's going to get to something. In Christ Jesus, watch what he's going to say. I have begotten you through the gospel. Say, in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So he's telling them how they were saved. I have begotten you. Remember, now Christ died on the cross. We always have the cross up here. You, every time when I can say it, everybody in this church know what the cross is. So if you ever need to get a shot of the cross, you can. Uh, uh, all right, but when I say that, all right, but he, he saved us at the cross. Christ died for our sins. He's already saved us, but you have to receive salvation. My job is to tell you what God has done for you, but if you never receive it, it's not God's fault. He provided salvation for every man. All right, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 
It said, Paul said, I write none of these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. I have begotten you through the gospel. So he's telling you how you were born of the Spirit, through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. So he's beseeching. Beseech means he's really begging, pleading. Be followers of me. Now, why is he saying that? I'm going to come down. Why is he saying that? Because if you're going to follow me, I have to know who I'm following. So Paul was following the Lord. So that's why Paul would say, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul followed Christ. If you came out of Egypt with Moses, who would you follow? Who God called? Who came and got you out of Egypt? Moses. So you ought to follow Moses, right? Now, you have to understand there were probably other people who act like or wanted to let you know they knew the way. But they didn't know the way. Their job was to badly influence you so you would get off the way. Only Moses knew the way, just like in the New Covenant, uh, the Gospel of Christ, or the New Covenant of the Gospel of Grace, only Paul knew the way. And what really messed with people is they follow other folk. And they're going to get lost because those people do not know the way. If you will follow the Apostle Paul in the New Covenant, you'll find your way. You'll find the way. Praise God. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says in verse 16, Be followers, I, wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. For this cause have I sent to you Timotheus, who is my son. Now he's talking about Timothy. He said, I sent you Timothy, my son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you to remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So this man, Paul, taught all the new covenant churches. Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly, Paul says, if the Lord will. And I will know that the speech of them which are puffed up, watch what he says, but I will come to you shortly. If the Lord will, and will know not the speech, not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. Paul said, I want to know, do you have the power? Because the kingdom of God is not, there it is, in word. Now he's talking about Old Testament wisdom, man wisdom. That's what he told you in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5. He said the kingdom of God is not in word, man wisdom, but in power. Then he's going to say this in the next verse. What will ye? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love? In the spirit of meekness? How should I come to you? See, so Paul is letting them know that he has the power. Being the apostle of the Gentiles, he has the power. Okay. So the kingdom of God come with power. Now, why is that so important? And what is that power? We're going to go to it now. I want to go, first of all, to the next, the next part. Now, this is going to take you to uh, my message. Let's go to 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, I gave you uh, verse 7 through 12. We're going to back up. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 7 through 12. 2 Corinthians. You're in 1 Corinthians, just go forward. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul is giving us, let's back up to verse 6, start off verse 6. Paul is backing up uh, the verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Now, Paul is giving us, he got the power. Now, remember, that's what we're going to talk about. The kingdom of God come with power. All right. Now, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, Paul says, For God, who commanded the light to shine, in, shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. He's talking about how he got the power. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God and the face of Jesus Christ. Think about what he says. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, well, where did God do that? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. He has shined in our hearts 
Remember Acts chapter 9? Paul saw a great light, brighter than the noonday sun. All right? He has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure. Now, he's talking about the kingdom. He's talking about the kingdom of God. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Watch what happened because he has the power. Watch what happened because he has the kingdom, the power. We are troubled on every side, yet not despair. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We, we'll, we'll, we'll trouble, but not distress. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is he doing that? Why did that man live that life? Because he has the kingdom. Why is he doing that? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. See, just getting the kingdom is the beginning. Now you must become what you have possessed. We have this treasure in earthly vessels. See, this is what God put in Paul, made him who he was today. All right? Now, it says, it might be made manifest, might be made manifest. For we which live are always delivered to death, for Jesus' sake. Why? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. First he says, your mortal body. Let's look at it together. Let's look at them both together. He says, verse 12, let's back up. So verse 12 says, so then death worketh in us but life in you. So watch what he says. We have in the same spirit of faith, I got to back up. I got to go all the way back to verse 10 first. Let's go to verse 10. Always bearing, verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Why? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest, watch this, in our body. So what is God doing? God put this treasure in Paul. It's going to make Paul an apostle. It's going to make Paul who he is. That's why Paul said, for by the grace of God, I am what I am. And then in verse 11, he says, we which live are always delivered to death. Why? For Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. See, it's the same thing that happened to John the Baptist. Once Christ showed up, John said, I must decrease. Why did he decrease? That Christ may increase. So that's what you have to understand. Once this kingdom comes inside of us, then we must decrease. See, the kingdom of God will not increase in us, or you will never know it, unless not decrease. See, it's just like I am a veil until the kingdom come. But once the kingdom come, the veil must go down. The curtains. Must, and as that happens, the light is now being shown. You see, it's no different in your, in your bedroom, living room, what you do in the morning when you get up. You got the curtains pulled from the night. But then all of a sudden you begin to open the curtain and what happened? Here come the light. That's what has to happen to us when God put the kingdom in us, we must decrease so the light that's in us can shine out to humanity. All right, now let's, let's, look, up. let's look at this. It says in verse number 13, I'm sorry, verse number 12. So then, he says, death worketh in us, but life in you. Death worketh in us, but life in you. Now, I wanted to put that in there because I, I want to get to a, to a point that I'm showing you. I'm showing you the power, but I want to go to when do you get the power? Now, let's go to, to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When do you get the power? See, the Bible already laid it out 
They asked Jesus a question. Now remember, you're only going to get some of this at 9 and some at 11 because most likely I'm going to have to, there's another part to this. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the question was asked Jesus. Let's start verse 6. I, I go back. In Acts 1, 6, the question was asked Jesus. They therefore will come together. They asked him saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Will you restore again the kingdom to Israel? Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? But watch what the Lord is going to say. Now, I'm going to do a teaching on this uh, the next time I do this, probably. Next, not today. He said to him, it is not for you to know the times of the season which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power. When was he going to receive power? When the kingdom come. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come. So now I know who the kingdom is. See, he told him, Paul said the kingdom of God come with power. Now he's telling you who the kingdom is. Here he says to him, it's not for you to know the time of the season which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come. He doesn't say after the kingdom has come. Now he says after the Holy Ghost has come. So I know the Holy Ghost is the kingdom, if you're keeping notes. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. He says, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come up on you. And you shall be witnesses of me, unto me, both in Jerusalem, all Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now he's talking about uttermost part of Israel. Most people take that and they say, oh, he's talking about all the earth, physical earth. No, he's not. The Bible is spiritual. Let me show you that before you get into further, that he's talking about Israel. Uh, let me show you one verse. I think that's Matthew 11. 23. See, they, they was not to go to the Gentiles. So that's why I say most people who teach the Bible do not know what they're talking about. Matthew chapter, and I'm not saying to put people down. I'm, I'm talking about I've been deceived by a lot of them. 40 years. Matthew uh, 10, 23, right? Yeah, I'm going to go back to Matthew chapter 10. No, I don't want to read all of that. I just want to show that Verse I want to show them, Matthew chapter number 10. You would not have gone over all Israel. That's what he says. Matthew chapter 10. And let's look at verse number 22 and 23. See, he's not talking about all the world. See, when people didn't hear that, he said the earth. And we know that earth is Israel. But you have to know that. All right, here we go. He said, he, and, and you shall be hated of all men. Who is he talking to? Talking to his 12 disciples. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. He that endure to the end shall be saved. The end of what? The end of the Old Testament. The end of the Old Covenant. The end of the law. See, the end of the Old Dispensation. See, that's what was ending. The new, end of the old covenant, that's why we have a new covenant. The old covenant ended. But when they persecute you in this city, flee to another city, verily I say to you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel. See, he told you, you would not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. But that's not what you hear people say. Let's go back. Let's go back to what I just ministered on. See, people will tell you, you, you would not have gone over the whole earth. See, he's not talking about the planet. This, this, the word of God is spiritual. The word earth means Israel. Now I was reading, what was I reading before that? Okay, Acts chapter 1. That's why, that's why you always follow, follow. That's what I'm saying, follow, see? Acts chapter 1. Watch what, he, watch what he say to this man. And verse number eight. Now I just showed you Israel. 
But it doesn't say earth when I read Matthew 10, 23. Let's go back. Let's read it one more time. Let's go back there one more time on the screen. Matthew 10, 23. See, you have to see what he's saying. He called them the cities of Israel. But when they persecute you in this city, flee also to another city. Verily I say to you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Now let's, now let's read Acts chapter 1. Because he told them to go into all the world. Go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. So when people take that, the first thing they say is, they went everywhere. That's why the no, people don't understand what it means by Matthew 28. Go you therefore in all the world. He's not talking about United States. There was no United States of America 2,000 years ago. I mean, I won't do like Sandra. Sandra go, da. She said, Daddy, it ain't no da. It's something else, but okay. Now, now let's... That's my other mess. I don't need to mess with this. I want to get to some other things I got for you today. So he said, you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come. All right, now let's go uh, look at... See, I got two messages here. I don't know which one to give you. I'm going, I'm going to deal with it this way. Write down the word power. The word power. I'm going to give you three words. The word power means having authority. Three words. Having a power. Mean, uh, uh, power means having authority. So the kingdom of God come with power. The kingdom of God come with authority. The kingdom of God come with control. And the kingdom of God come with influence. Now remember, he's talking to, Paul is talking to the church. He letting them know that he has the power. He has the power. So otherwise, having authority, the kingdom of God. Having authority, having control, having influence. Three things, right? You don't want to write down the word edification. Because this is what Paul is talking about. The kingdom of God come with power. The kingdom of God come with authority. See, I do not have the authority in the church if I don't have the kingdom. The Holy Ghost is God's kingdom. So that's why, that's why he said when this first started off in the prayer in Matthew chapter 6, pray, we'll go that next, just write it down. We, we don't, I don't want to speak out of turn. Edification, you got that down? Now I'm going to give you certain words for edification because edification has a lot of meaning. But the whole purpose of Paul's ministry is because he has the power, he has the authority to edify. The word edification means build up one's faith. So if you go to a ministry that do not have the authority, do not have the power of the Holy Spirit, they cannot build up your faith. can't do it. They don't have the power to do it. They don't have the authority to do it. Now, the next thing is edification, the purpose of power. Edification is the purpose of power. So if, I, if God gave me power, because I'm the pastor of the church, God gave me power. Why did he give me power? To edify the church. So the purpose of power, purpose of the authority, is to edify. Now, it doesn't mean I can't pray for people, lay hands on people, because that's all in this message. But the purpose is to edify, is to build the church. See, it's not for me to be seen, it's to edify the church, it's to build your faith. So you have to understand, this is, this is why so many people cannot continue in troubled times. See, a whole lot of folks can, can go on when everything is going good. 
everybody laughing at your jokes and everybody, but when people start listening to you and you get in a situation where you don't think nobody there but yourself, and when trouble comes, situations come, then you're going to need your faith. And that's why you have to understand, you need to go to a ministry where, you, and when I say go, I mean really go. And listen to the word instead of the word, because you got to work on your faith. See, that's why you want to come in here. My job is to help you build up your faith. So when the situations of life come, come they are coming. Now you'll be able to have, use your faith to get out. Remember I gave you a teaching two teachings ago, three teachings ago, faith receives what grace has provided. So you need to already be eating that. You can't get what grace has provided for you if you don't use your faith. If you don't use your faith, you're going to remain in the same predicament you were 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. You're going to have to start using your faith. But you can't use your faith if it's not strong. You won't get it built up. You're in and out, up and down, in and out, up and down. Still, still dealing with the same problems and issues that you had five and ten years ago. He's been going to church for ten years. Still, ten years ago, you had that same problem in your life. Now, what's going on? See, you're not, you're not building up your faith. You just think it's going to happen because you just ask God, ask God, Lord, just, no, 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 this is something you got to do. When it comes down to your faith, he gave you the faith. That was Romans 12, 3. He dealt to every man the measure of faith. Ephesians 4, 7, he gave everybody grace. See, he gave you all of that. You got to work out your salvation. You got to use your faith. You got to build up your own faith. And that's what I'm here to do for you. You at a ministry where a person has the power, the authority to edify your faith, to help build up your faith. This word edification means build up one's faith. All right, here's another word for edification. To help construct your life. See, when a person, when a person built this church, it was called under construction. When something is built, being built is under construction. And that's my job. Organize. Help organize your life. See, so usually when you come, in a, get, come into church on a ministry like this that teaches, you'll find out that your life is out of order. It won't be long for you to find that out. My job is to exalt you. Establish your life. My job is to help that. When I say your life, I'm using your faith. But he, my job is to establish your faith, help establish your faith, and help also to organize your faith. Make sure your faith is in the power of God. And the last is to improve. So those are things that, that I gave you for edification. Construct, organize, establish, improve, build up, See, all those are what's supposed to happen to your faith. You're going to be here, that's going to happen to you. Because that word is going to keep on coming. Somebody say amen. Now let's go look at some of this. Let's, let's go to Romans chapter 1, verse 8. Let's go to work. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, and verse number 8. See, one of the greatest things about people, they are not consistent. They're not consistent. See, when you're not consistent, you have a problem with your faith. It's no different than you go out to start your car up every Sunday morning, every, in the morning. If your car don't start in the morning, you're going to be mad because it's not consistent. When you put money in a car, you want to make sure you go out there every morning and you hit that starter, you want that baby, room. that's what I want to hear. I ain't got no time, no stuff. I got to be at work at half hour. I got to be at work, you understand? Consistent. So how you think God feel about his product, which is you and me, when we are not consistent? 
I mean, we at church this Sunday, may not be that next Sunday. At church this week, may not be that next week. We up and we down, we in and we out. Not consistent. You know what's happening? You are having problem with your faith. Your faith is weak. Your faith needs to be built up. It's no different than a car engine. Like I'm telling you, with a, with a, with, you got to see it just like you do a battery. Why that car start every time you go sit down in it? Because the battery is built up. Leave the light on a couple of days and see what happens. Amen? You go out there, that car not going to start, most likely. Don't put no gas in it. See, you got to do what you're supposed to do, and, and it will work. It will work. That's how it is with your faith. So when the troubles come, situation come, problems come, all this other stuff come, your faith will be right there to carry you through it. Your faith is what carries you through situations. And if your faith is weak, your faith cannot carry you through the situation. It can't handle the storms of life. See, that's why Paul said, taking, we're going to get to this when I get to Ephesians, taking the shield of faith, whereby you are able to quench all the fiery dots of the enemy. See, that's what your faith does. All that stuff that's coming at you from the enemy, that's what the shield, the shield does. But when your faith is weak, it's just like it was with Moses when they came out of Egypt. They had to hold up his arm. See, when your faith is weak, you need somebody to help hold your arms up. But they can't do it all the time. People can't be there all the time and fight your battle. You got to hold your own shield up. Look at somebody say, hold up your own shield. You got to do it yourself. People are not going to be with you all the time. Romans chapter 1. Now watch what Paul says in verse number 8. Paul said, I thank God, my God. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. What was he thanking God for them for? That their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. He's talking about all Israel. That was the world to them. That was their community. Nine tribes. I'm sorry, 12 tribes. Covered the whole land of Israel. He said, look, your faith is spoken throughout the whole world. So when they went into Asia, Asia Minor, the seven churches, all those places where Paul has set up these churches, he said, your faith, these people is talking about how strong you are in all the places I go to. All the trials and the stuff you're going through, you're still saying, praise the Lord. You're still saying thank you, Jesus. You're still saying hallelujah. See, you're still holding on to your joy. And people do not realize when Paul wrote the latter books that we're going through, Philippi, Ephesians, he was in prison when he wrote Philippians. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad. He's in prison telling the church to rejoice. Rejoice always, and I, and I say again, rejoice. This man in prison, that's what he's trying to tell you. Don't let where you are keep you from rejoicing. See, the thing about it is, the thing about it, if your faith is strong, like your car engine, your battery, it'll start in the winter. Huh, come on, you get out there in the morning time, you got an inch, two inches of snow, you ain't worried about it. Roop, you go right on and pull right on through it. Why? Because what you're driving was made for that. So that's why God gave you faith. It's already been proven. It's already been tested. You got to know who faith is here. It's not just your faith. It's his faith. That's why the Bible told you, Galatians, uh, I'm sorry, 220. Galatians 2.20. Put it on the screen. See, you got to know who faith you got. See, he, he gave you his faith because it's already been tested. It's already been proven. 
He's already been used. That's why I read you 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. We have in the same spirit of faith. Let's look at the screen. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That's who I live by. See, I live by the faith of the Son of God. See, that's who you live. You live by his faith. So his faith's been proven. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 13. See, his faith has already been proven. You got the same faith I have. The key is, what are you doing with it? You can't sit up and watch another world, all my children, some days of our lives and stuff, and think your faith will be growing. You got to keep, you got to stay in this word. That's why the Bible said, building up yourselves, Upon your most holy faith, you got to build your faith up. Watch what it says. We having the same spirit of faith. Hello? Same spirit of faith. How did I get it? I believe. That's how I got it. Therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. So you got God's faith. What are you doing with it? And you know, you know, how I know when the trouble comes, you fall apart. I'm trying to tell you, boy, my wife and I, we, we found out how to, get through, how to get through a married life. If your faith is not strong and situation comes up in your marriage, you're going to fall apart. You're going to go from, honey, I love you, I adore you, until we're going to get a divorce. Now you tell me how you can go from A to Z that fast. What happened to B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I? <laughs> we was in love, and all of a sudden, we want to get a divorce. You know why? Our faith. That's why our faith was. Our faith was there once. I'm not just talking. Our faith was there once. And we didn't want to deal with the situation at hand. And that's what happened with people. When the problems of life comes up, when the situation comes up, when things are not like it's supposed to be, when the wife ain't acting like she's supposed to act, when the husband ain't acting like he's supposed to act, when the children are not acting like they're supposed to act, when the dog, when the cat, you understand, <laughs> is not acting like they're supposed to act, the first thing we do is fall apart. We want to throw the dog out with the cat. Cat ain't did nothing, dog it, get out. Because we can't deal with the problem. So what we're going to do, we're going to leave the problem. We're not going to deal with it, we're going to leave it. We're going to walk away from it. People walk away from 20 and 30 and 40 years of marriage. Are you kidding me? Because they can't handle it. Got children in there, grandchildren, but they can't handle it. Because they would not spend time building up their faith. They do everything else and then they do nothing to their faith. And they don't realize faith is how you access the grace of God in your life. Amen. We do nothing. We do nothing to help ourselves. Thank God for money in the bank and thank God for money. Thank God for all that. But it can't help your marriage. If you don't have faith, it can't help your business, it can't help your church, it can't help your everyday life unless you have faith and your faith is strong. You can have all of that, but when you walk out of that car and it's a foot of snow on the ground or, or three inches or four inches or five or whatever, and you got that, it's zero degrees out there and that wind is blowing, when you step in that car, your money would not start that engine. Thank God for all the money you got, but it's not going to start that engine. You're going to need one thing to start that engine, and that's going to be that battery. And when you hit that switch, go, vroom, you sit there, <laughs> praise the Lord. See, that's the same thing going to happen with your faith. When your situation is going bad, and you use your faith, your, your life going to go, vroom. 
And that's when you're going to raise your hand and thank God that I have his faith and my faith is charged up and my faith is boosted up and, and bold as a lot. Hey, my faith can take it. Look at somebody said, my faith can take it. When you're going through some stuff in life, you got to make sure your faith can take it. This faith I'm talking about has been in the fire. That's what I'm talking about. That's why they're showing you all these stories over here about Daniel and the lounge in. My faith has been in the lounge in. See, you have God's faith. It's been in the lounge in. It know, you, he knows the faith will keep you if you're in the lounge in. He know his faith will keep you if you're in the fire and funnest. All these Old Testament were just showing you what God's faith would do in your life. Whatever you went through, whatever he went through, when he got down to the Red Sea, he know the faith would move. It would move, brother. It would open up that Red Sea and you'll walk over. Because your faith, you got the faith to do it. When they got to Jericho, they couldn't go over, but they had the faith to move that wall. Everything you saw in the Old Testament, it was showing you God's faith and what it would do in your life if you have it. You are the generation that now you got it. Don't tell me what it came to. The same faith you got right now would move God to heal your body. But you got to use it. Don't tell me what God can't do. You got to use it. Don't tell me what it can't do. It's too late. God already told you, all things are possible to them that believe. Be it unto you according to your faith. So don't, don't you, you, you got to understand, this is how this ministry breathes. This is how it works. My wife will tell you, I believe God. I got a prayer book in my bathroom, and I got people in there. I don't care what they go through. When they call me on the phone, I put them in my book. I pray for them. If I think about them, I get them and pray for them. You, when you are part of this ministry, that's my responsibility. It's to pray for you. So when you're going through something, you can call me boo-hooing and crying and boo-hooing. I'm going to put your name in the book and say, okay then, have a nice day. Because I'm not going to boo-hoo with you. Amen. You don't get it done by boo-hooing. You use your faith. If you're going to see miracles, if you're going to see miracles, if you're going to see miracles, you got to use your faith. You're not doing it anyway. God is doing it. But God is not going to do it if you don't use your faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that God is, and then God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You got to use your faith. Look at somebody say, you must use your faith. Can't be over here boohooing, waking up the neighborhood, got the dog barking and crying all night. got to use your faith. So that's why Paul says, Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 8, watch what he says. I thank God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. In verse number 9, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by any means, not at length, I may have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. I long to see you. Why, Paul? I want to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. To the end, you may be established. What was he wanted to impart to them? He wanted to impart to them some faith. He wanted to build up their faith. So they can be established. Paul had went to this church 
Paul had went three different missionary journeys. And there are some of the churches, when he went back, they had moved back the law. They was over there at Peter, James, and John church, getting their getting they feet wet. They was over there at Peter, James, and John church, getting re-water baptized. you catch up. They was over there at Peter, James, and John church, celebrating the Passover, eating the bread off the table again. Paul showed up, and Paul was hot. Paul said to them, who has bewitched you? Who has you been listening to? You are saved by grace, not by works. You are in a new covenant. And I want to say something else. There is no curses in the new covenant. You can't find them. They are not new covenant. That's why people do not understand the book of Revelation. It's all the fulfillment of the curses that happened to Israel. They don't curse the new covenant. Galatia 3.10. Galatia 3, Go back there. Put it on the screen. See, ain't no curses in the new covenant. So you have to understand that. There are no curses in the new covenant. That's what happened at the cross. Paul says, for as many of you of the works of the law are under the curse. So that's why Christ died on the cross. Because all those folks who were under the works of the law, they were under the curse. For it's written, curse is everyone that hang him on the tree. Isn't that something? For it's written, curses is everyone that continues not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. That's how, the, if you, under the law, the curse came. Because you could not keep the law. But the Bible said, for many of us, verse 11, I'm moving on. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Nobody could be made righteous under the law. In the sight of God. It's evidence. Because the just had to live by faith. That's how you live today. And the law is not of faith. Now you got to understand something. When he said law, he's talking about works. Romans 11 and 6 told you, if it's works, it's no law. If it's works, it's no more grace. The law is not of faith. The man that doeth them shall live in them. You, didn't, you were not under the law. Christ hath, past tense, redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's over with. Being made a curse for us, for it's written curses to everyone that hangeth on the tree. Why did Christ die on the cross? Here it is, the next verse, that the blessings of Abraham. How many know what the blessings of Abraham in this church is? Come on, everybody ought to know in this church by now, what's the blessing of Abraham? Abraham did one thing. Abraham believed God and God counted it for righteousness. What's the blessing of Abraham? It's God's righteousness. See, you need to write that in your Bible. That's the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham is about blessings. That's why they sang this morning, blessings, blessings. There are no curses in the new covenant. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentile. See, the blessing of Abraham has come on us already. Let me give you a little bit under the blessing, the blessing of Abraham. Under the blessing of Abraham or the Abrahamic covenant is how Israel got out of Egypt. It was not the law that brought Israel out of Egypt. It was the Abrahamic covenant. For God has said, I will bless them that bless you. And I curse them that curse you. Your enemy will be my enemy. Those who fight against you fight against me. So that's how... Israel got out of Egypt under the Abrahamic covenant. So they crossed the Red Sea under the Abrahamic covenant. <laughs> this is awesome stuff. They crossed the Red Sea under the Abrahamic covenant because under the Abrahamic covenant, nothing could stand in, there in, in front of them. So when they got down to the Red Sea, God said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to go forward. Forward, that's the Red Sea. 
It doesn't matter. If you go forward, it'll move. Under the Abrahamic covenant, it's nothing but favor. They came out under the Abrahamic covenant. They did not receive the law until they got to the mountain. Moses would have got Ten Commandments. Before then, they were only strict on the Abrahamic covenant. They just had to be circumcised. Every man had to be circumcised. He was in the Abrahamic covenant. And that's what God did. God brought them out under the Abrahamic covenant. God put them over in Goshen under the Abrahamic covenant. God went and got them from bondage under the Abrahamic covenant. God fed them by Joseph under the Abrahamic covenant. Went back and got Joseph, uh, uh, Jacob, and brought him to the promised land because of the Abrahamic covenant. Couldn't let, him, couldn't let him stay there, and he didn't have provision. Had to go back and get him. Because God had to provide for him. You got to understand, when you study the Abrahamic covenant, that's what took care of Israel the whole time from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were taken care of by the Abrahamic covenant. And so that's what you got to understand. Now the law came. Abrahamic covenant ended. Called the covenant of circumcision. But because Christ died on the cross, he gave us grace back. You got to understand something. You got abundant grace. You have a better covenant than Abraham had. God called the better promises, better covenant with better promises. But you don't know what you got because you won't build your faith. You can't use it unless your faith is strong. Because God will, God, you, you're going to have to, whew, you got, your faith got to be strong. Look what Paul says in Romans chapter number 1 verse 12. To the end, you may be established. That's what he says. I want to impart some spiritual gift. That's verse 11. I want to impart some spiritual gift. What is he talking about? He's talking about faith. He has to impart it. And to impart it means you got to preach the word, and that's how you're going to get it. Why? For you can be established. That is, that is that I may be confident. That I may be confident together with you. By their mutual faith, both of you and me. And that's the purpose of your faith, is to comfort others. Your job is to edify. Your job is to comfort, to build up. But you can't do it if your faith is not strong. And this is what happened is, it's when, when a person's faith is not strong, and you call them, and you need a little boost off, with you, with they, you need a little jump start, and uh, they, mm, 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 too. Can't help you out. Can you help a brother? Can you edify me? Can you build me up? I need somebody to talk to about 15 minutes. They can't do it. If they do it, they drain, you're going to drain them. And when they get through, they call somebody else. Can you help a brother out there? <laughs> you took all of the juice out of their battery. This is what we're going to talk about the next service. I hope you're here. See, we got to come down to a place where we can understand that we're going to need this to live. 2 Corinthians 10, 15, just one verse we've done for today, for this 9 o'clock service. 2 Corinthians 10, 15, so good to see you today. 2 Corinthians 10, 15, your faith got to increase. Look at somebody that said, but your faith has to increase. Watch what it says, watch what it says. Not boasting of the thing without our measure. That is of other man's labors. But having hope when your faith is increased. See, if, if, if your faith is increased, you can have hope. You get out there and hit that, hit that car battery and that baby going, it's over. Ain't no hope there. But if you get out there and you go, whoop. See, you got hope now. So that's what happened. You, your faith got to increase. Come on, say, Lord, Lord help me, help me. In, to increase my faith. And the only way it's going to happen is you're going to have to turn the word on. You've got to put the word on. Your faith is not going to increase just because you pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit is good. I pray in the Spirit. But it's not going to increase your faith. So then faith come by. Hearing. And hearing by. 
You got to hear the word of God for faith increase. Let me see that again. Watch what it says again. Not boasting of the thing without our measure that is of the man's labor. But having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be able to enlarge, that we can be enlarged, enlarged by you. See, you, you're supposed to make somebody else greater. You're supposed to be able to help somebody else because your faith is so strong. No need to ask you to boost me off if you owe that tit, 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 tit. You can't help me. You're not going to walk up to a person who's murmuring and complaining about how bad it is and what they're going through. You're not going to ask them, help, help get my car started. I need you to encourage me in the Lord this morning. They can't do it. You already heard them tell you how bad it was. But if you do what God told you to do, when somebody needs you, you'll be there for them. Give the Lord a great big hand. I haven't started on you yet. I haven't even started on you. I got so much word for you, but I have to give you so much. Right now, you got to do something. You got to get your faith built. I'm going to move into the next part of this message, but I'm going to start right here because I got some more to show you. You got to get your faith built. Your faith got to increase. You got to put on the whole armor of God. This is no, this is no game. This is, a, this is the armor. This put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the armor of God. You don't wrestle against people. You don't fight against one another. See, what happened is these two things must work together. Your faith and your love got to work together. And you got to understand something. Your faith won't work if your love don't grow. You got to grow in love just like you got to grow in faith. And most people just can't love and they don't understand because you can't love, your faith won't work. Faith working by love. Do, do you understand how this thing works? God gave you faith. He gave you love. And your love got to work for one of your love is for others. And God fixed it that way that if you don't love, your faith won't work. Tell somebody, if you don't love, your faith won't work. Faith is not going to work by itself. Faith can't work by itself. It takes God. God is love. It takes love to work your faith. And that's what people don't understand. I don't care what somebody did to you. Forgive them. I don't have no time for my faith not to work. I need my faith. I don't want to get in my car and it won't start. That's how faith is. You want to use faith, now your faith won't work. You got to have faith. This is how you access the grace of God. I get everything that's in the grace of God with my faith. And I'm going to need love to make my faith work. And it won't work because I'm over here angry with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 said, Moreover, brothers, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you have received and where you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. Christ died for your sins, he was buried, and God raised him from the dead. That's how you're saved. Receive God's salvation right now and let God get the work in your life. He'll give you faith. He'll give you his love. He'll give you his grace. He'll give you everything when he give you his son. My time is up and I thank you for yours. And the door of faith is open unto you.